you know, to be here with you, Zanena, is absolutely phenomenal to be able to interview you and ask you some questions. So I'm going to start with an introduction uh, with about you, and then I've got some questions that I want to ask. So uh, Zanena Conde was born in Kensington Market. Uh, her parents came come from St. Lucia and Barbados, where they had worked as teachers. They were prevented from continuing their teaching careers in Canada because at the time, people from the African diaspora were not allowed to hold teaching positions, which is just absolutely shocking and unbelievable. Uh, she studied at the University of Toronto, received her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Education degrees. She was a teacher and principal in the Toronto District School Board. She was a member of the Co Cooperative Commonwealth Federation and later the New Democratic Party. In 1990, she was the first Black woman elected as an Ontario MPP. And after being appointed the Minister of Community and Social Services, she became the first Black woman to serve as a cabinet minister in a Canadian government. She is the co-founder of Tiger Lily, a newspaper for visible minority women, and once co-hosted a Toronto Arts Against Apartheid Festival. She was the president of the Urban Alliance for Race Relations, and she was one of the founders of the TDSB's Afrocentric School. She served as the chair of the Black Legal Action Center from 2017 to 2021, and she is currently active with the Black Student Achievement Community Advisory Committee at the Toronto District School Board, and is working with the City of Brampton to make sure their services are inclusive and reflective of the group that they serve. Zanina, so my first question is, is there such a thing as retirement for an icon like you? I had hoped for a retirement, but... Um... Things keep being presented to me that are that are interesting and more than that, that are necessary. And uh, certainly the education of our children is is one of those things. So anytime I'm asked, I always uh, I always end up saying yes. Yeah. Well, you have been an inspiration and a mentor for generations of, of black youth in this country. And you've also been a bit of a mentor to old white guys like me. And I want to talk about when you were the president of the Urban Alliance for Race Relations, I sat down with you and I told you about a study I was starting on the impact of student debt. And you said to me, you said that, you know, Ontario's tuition fees and our student debt levels are a form of systemic racism. Can you talk about what you, you meant by that comment? Well, uh, what I meant simply is that when uh, you have a population who uh, are not even able to uh, acquire the kind of work for which they are uh, uh, qualified of, of, and of which they are capable. And you realize then that they are not making the same funds. They're not bringing in the same money in a general way that, uh, that other uh, populations are. And then you raise the tuition fees so that, in fact, their children or they themselves are unable to afford the education that would put them at the next level. And uh, it, it's a form of, of control. It's racism is control. And that's a way of controlling the numbers of people who move into those professions who move into those jobs and those roles where they require this training. Uh, it's not only the tuition, you know, because they, they all know that. Those who raise the tuition, the governments who raise the tuition know that there are all kinds of other expenses which go along with university education. There are, there are books, there is travel, there is the access to, to means. And most students, for example, when I went to university, I, I uh, went to school full time for the first two years and worked full time for the first two years. So that, you know, you, you, you and, and juggled the summer courses, et cetera, so that you would finish so that you're adding an additional burden by now raising, raising the tuition fees is in fact exclusive. Right, and so I hear what you're saying. And, and when you said that, it was a light bulb moment for me. It sounds like there's an intentionality here. Oh, you know? I believe there is. Yeah. You know, uh, they, uh, I, I hate to sound paranoid, but uh, definitely there is. There's, a, there's an intention 
to control who leads. Always at the back of everything, you begin to analyze what is this meaning to do to the society when politically a move is made. And there is, I believe, an intention to control who leads. It not only admits uh, uh, effects, it not only affects black students and indigenous students, it, it also affects the poor. You know, if the, if the poor could, oh, poor Caucasian, could only realize that what they do to control blacks and, and indigenous population also affects them. It affects them in ways I've seen it in years for years in schools where I taught that uh, they are unable to, to uh, you know, to find the tuition, to even consider tuition. Some of them just rule it out. So only the exceptional move forward. And it's a control for who leads. So how do we overcome this? How do we, you know, how do we dismantle this? Well, you know, uh, I had a father who was really very interested in government and uh, always talked about the way it should work and the way it did work. And I think that ultimately we have to realize we really are the government if we, if, if, if we stuck together. I used to say to my, my uh, friends who uh, in Kensington uh, where we lived, there are more of us than there are of them. If we collectively as people focused on putting our votes in a position where, or supported people who were in fact supportive of our rising forward, our moving forward. That's one thing we can do. The other thing is to bring it to attention, bring it to the attention of others that, that uh, part-time courses, that summer courses, that afternoon courses are something that we, uh, we, we need and we need access to, that make it as part of the compensation for certain kinds of work. So that in fact, uh, uh, we'll pay your tuition to do certain study or a certain part of it. And the other thing is that uh, we have to be clear about, uh, about the governments that we support and the issues that they support. It always shocks me that I find that there are people who, who um, have put their vote, and I, 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 I uh, have put their vote next to the names of candidates who in fact are working in opposition to their needs. You know, I, it, it shocks me. So you're talking about unity, you're talking about small steps, you know, because you said there's more of us than there are of them. And so how do we, how do we get people to put, you know, to actually look at who is running, what they are going to do or what they have done in office, so that they're voting for someone who's actually going to support, you know, their growth. You know, uh, one of the things we can do, and, and uh, I, I have been asked to visit various churches, that's before the pandemic. I mean, we're all, but, uh, and go and speak to people about what voting, uh, what they're looking at and how they should be placing their vote. That's not telling them to vote for this person as opposed to that one, but rather going through the exercise. What are you interested in? What things does this, the provincial government take care of? What things does the federal government take care of? What things of those things are, are of particular interest to you and why? And who is offering the better of those choices? You know, I spent years in schools teaching in elementary and secondary and as an adjunct professor at the universities. And we teach people that, uh, you know, we teach them about uh, government in such a way that it doesn't necessarily move into their realization of their power. And they do have that power. 
if they could collectively and, you know, they'll vote for people because they're nice guys. He's a nice guy. He's really, you know, a good friend of mine, or he's very, very kind, or even people who voted because the, uh, the, the candidate had taken their child to uh, the cottage for a weekend. We all, we all remember that story. And, and, uh, and they thought he was a very uh, good person. And yet that person may have been voting for or suggesting moves that would in fact undermine the uh, possibilities for their children's education. They don't see the two steps at the same time. And I think, I think it's a fault in, of, of our education system. You know, we go all through education and we, we teach people about responsible government and representative government, and we fail to teach them that they are the government. That is such a, a powerful statement. And you're absolutely right. I remember, you know, learning about government in, in school, in high school, and we went through all the formalities of it, but that's not, that's not government. Government is actually, it's the conversations and it's actually the policies and who, who's winning and who's losing and who's making the decisions. Those are the questions that, yeah. So I, I'm just so inspired by this. So what should be like the people listening now, what should they be doing taking what what do you want them to do and what what do you want them to realize after this conversation i want them to to realize the effect that the decisions are have on poor children on black children on indigenous children on immigrants who come and may be well qualified, but have to move into a system, the effects that their decisions relative to government make. I mean, it's, it, it, it um, when I, the short time that I was in government, it made me realize that um, there are platforms which allow you to decide what, who you're going to support. It was the platforms that allowed me to decide whether I ran or not and who I ran for because I had been asked by other parties. But after the election, the most important thing I think that's discussed is how to win the next election. And rather than the issues of platform. And so if you're sending one, someone to government, make sure you're sending someone who is aggressive enough to say, I came here because of these issues. And these issues are what I want to work on. And hopefully, people seeing us work on those issues will bring us support so that we may, if they're satisfied, be elected next time. But that's the order and the priority of importance to me. Those are great words to, you know, to, to send everybody off with to, to close on. Zanina, it is such an honor to be, you know, here with you, to be interviewing you. Thank you so much for being here. And you are truly a Canadian icon and a, and a pioneer. And you've opened up so many doors and there are so many other people coming through those doors because of your work. So thank you. And thank you for your continued work for the community. Thank you. Thank you very much.